My name's Trapper Mike. I'm known as the Python Cowboy. I sleep out in the Florida Everglades and I hunt big ass snakes. Definitely want to watch where you're stepping. Right now it's gator mating season, so they're out and about in areas you normally wouldn't find them, looking for mates, looking to nest. The Burmese python has decimated 99% of our native fur-bearing wildlife, and that's a big issue out here in the Everglades. And I've made it my personal mission to come out here, find them, and remove them. Something moving up here. Python, python. So we're meeting up with my good buddy Nick today. Uh, he's the head of the Florida Gladesmen and the head of the History of the Florida Gladesmen Foundation. I'm gonna go out also with Bruce today. He's the um, president of the Broward Airboat Conservation Full Track Club. Recently, there was a big python captured underneath someone's cypress camp, actually in their flooring. The historic catch made underneath a home in the Everglades. Can you imagine no. that underneath your home? No. That's 16 feet long. 16 foot python captured there, and there was also dozens of eggs nearby. No, thank you. Half of the nest successfully hatched and got away, and they were able to kill the other half of the nest, about 50 eggs total. And uh, they're just gonna kind of show me the area, let me get a, a little bit of lay of the land, some history of the area and the camps, and I'm gonna give them my, my opinion and expertise on, on what we're looking at here. Um, if I need to start focusing in the area, try to give them a little peace of mind and just really see what we're working with. Bruce is a great guy. Um, he's just a wealth of knowledge. He's gonna take us to the deepest part of the Everglades. Um, it's also called the Meteor Hole or Whirlpool. They've lost airboats in there, they've lost full tracks with dogs attached on them in there, and it's just a really cool, neat spot with a lot of history. This spot that we're standing here, you look out, you notice it's round. And uh, it's actually, we don't know how deep it is, but we know it's at least 90 feet deep. And that's the deepest part of the Florida Everglades. Everglades normally is about 18 inches to 24 inches deep. The way they determined this happened was they feel it was a, a meteorite hit the earth. And basically, they've had diving teams here. Uh, they've had National Geographic dove this site. And those measurements were anywhere from 90 to 120 feet deep. Miami Dolphins used to come out here a lot. They enjoyed coming out here and spending time with a man who lived here, a man named Wayne Cohn. So there's a whole history behind the Everglades and essentially the Gladesmen. Um, they used to be a band of smugglers and outlaws, drug runners, moonshiners, and um, commercial fishermen and hunters living off the land. And um, the way of life has definitely been changed. It's sort of been taken away a little bit, but now it's shifted into a whole nother type of Gladesman. Um, the modern Gladesman, it's all about conservation and preserving our livelihood and our history. And, and essentially preserving the Everglades. The, the Everglades mean so much to some of these Gladesmen out here that they really want their final resting place to be here because they found happiness here and they, they feel they find happiness forever. And uh, the last camp we went to, uh, Lost Lake, Wayne Cohn, he's right here and his girlfriend, Barbara Alouette is right behind him. His logo is just a good old boy. That's what everybody, he always said. And so in his, underneath his headstone is his ashes a six pack of old Milwaukee beer, a Confederate flag, and a pack of DAQ cigarettes. That's what he did, that's what he enjoyed out here. So it's with him till eternity. Our, our main 
concern is we're guardians of the Everglades. We, we watch out for what's going on out here. We're losing the Everglades and it's important for us to preserve it and, and to fight for it. And also making sure that future generations are educated on our history and what we're trying to do today. So we're heading out to um, the island where they just caught that big 16-foot snake with the eggs. Uh, we'll leave it unnamed for now. We're gonna go take a look around, uh, check out the eggs, check out the scene, see if maybe we can find some of the escaped hatchlings and uh, try to give them a little peace of mind about what's going on. Mike, 10 days ago, there was a 16-foot python caught right here where, where we're coming up to these gas tanks. They oh, was, the it was sitting on 50 eggs. They basically yeah, recovered 25 eggs and 25 eggs hatched and were loose. It basically, they went to turn on, they saw it up here. It's called up here. They hit it with a stick and that's when it, it basically came at them. And, after and what, so they came down here and then they, I mean, they were, I'm assuming, Tending to their camp, and yeah. then they noticed they were the turning, piece of the snake. They were yeah, the yeah, they were turning, changing this tank. Wow! And that's when it uh, happened. I've actually never seen an, an egg before. 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 I never realized that they're that size. They're huge. It had to have been sitting up underneath this uh, cypress camp for a month or two, sitting on the nest, because these were hatching. Half of them hatched when by the time they found it, so. This thing was under here for a while. The size of that snake they took the other day oh, yeah. could, could take a deer. Definitely deer eater. Yeah, this snake was what, over 100 pounds? 165 pounds. <laughs> 165 pounds. And keep in mind, 165 pounds after it laid eggs and after it hasn't eaten for a month or two. You know, that's realistically a 200 pound snake. So it's, it's crazy to think and it's solid muscle. Yeah. So um, it's definitely a formidable predator. It's really discouraging and sad to see that there are snakes that big nesting up north. You know, that's really what I'm trying to prevent and what I'm working so hard fighting down south. Moose is definitely smelling on something over here though. He always, he always listens to me unless he's like locked onto something. So we took a look around. Uh, I even had Moose smell around a little bit. He definitely was hitting on a lot of snake scent. But um, from what I've seen, I didn't see any hatchlings. Of course, there's not gonna be much sign or indication from the hatchlings. It's, it's sort of to be expected. You can't get them all. Um, they're, they're really elusive creatures and um, they're traveling out looking for move, more food because they've eaten up the Everglades so much. I, I still feel that we are managing the population and slowing the spread, but uh, I feel we do need to concentrate a little bit more north now. Martin County trapping. Oh, yes. Uh, you got my message? Um, yes, ma'am. You called earlier about the iguanas? Yes. Yes, I did. Um, so you, you said you have a big uh, mess on your porch. Um, tell me yeah, exactly I'm what you got going yes. on. Yeah, I've got, I've got, I usually have just a uh, little message from these young uh, iguanas that run up and down my tree. But uh, this morning, and uh, again, uh, uh, four days ago, I had this big, I get calls all day long every day uh, from concerned homeowners and also um, entire communities. The HOAs or the POAs will give me a call. Alrighty, uh, I'll go ahead and get started and let you know on my progress. Please, thank you so much. Yes. I, I hate these things. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'll get started. Thank oh, you. Bye-bye. Okay. You. Their home is under attack, they feel. They have these huge lizards that can be aggressive hanging all around their backyard, in their front yard, uh, sometimes up on their porch and patio. They leave droppings everywhere and their feces contain salmonella, so it's a health issue. And they also do compete with our native uh, wildlife or vegetation and they destroy our, our native wildlife nest. It's a big issue and um, I do my best to deal with it. Right now I'm gassing everything up. I use an air rifle, high pressure pump to pump it up and uh, See if we can't go shoot a couple. He's on 
the fans. So we've always had, you know, problems with iguanas, but more now than ever, it, it's it's a really big problem, and that's because the last couple years we haven't really had a good cold snap. Um, the iguanas will die out. Um, they actually fall out of the trees, sorta in a coma, and um, a lot of times people will take that chance to remove them and euthanize them and get them out of the environment. So look over here. Look at all the iguanas just in this one stretch in in one backyard. Um, and this really is the problem. I could be out here all day, all night, you know, for months, for the whole year, and in some areas you're just scratching the surface. Um, it, it's a big problem. They've exploded out of control, and there's just so many now that it's beyond a full-time job. Look at this guy. So this is what I call the Godzillas. Big, orange, these guys are real aggressive. They make beautiful wallets, beautiful products and they're just big breeders. Look at the gut on this thing. Uh, this is actually the best part of meat right here. Uh, the big males, they have these big cheeks, and in here is just a, a delicious piece of meat. I usually keep this for myself, and uh, I'm always real happy to get these big guys because it's a lot of skin, a lot of leather, and a lot of meat I can sell and work with. So when I capture the iguanas alive, um, I'll read them their rights. Got the right to remain silent. Anything you do or say be held against you in an iguana court. Shouldn't have ate them mangoes. I'll put them on the ground and restrain them. Uh, I handcuff their hands behind their back with electrical tape. The reason I do this is the electrical tape is the easiest on their skin. It doesn't hurt them. When I put them in a, in a cage or, or some kind of container, with, especially with other iguanas, they get stressed out, they freaked out, and they try to escape. And, and they'll actually tear themselves and their cage mates to pieces. So this one's worked his way out of his handcuffs. And you see how he's freaking out in there? And the ones that are handcuffed, they're, they're just chilling. Um, they, they start to spaz out and then they're gonna hurt themselves. So I, I'm gonna retape these guys up because I don't want any issues. If there's an animal up in a tree and I'm worried about possibly missing it, I don't want my bullet to come down onto somebody, hit somebody's car, or something like that. So in that situation, I have a, a long telescopic fiberglass pole I use, and it has a wire noose at the end. Um, carefully and skillfully, I'll slip it over their head and over their neck and tighten down and sort of wrestle them to me. Um, and I was able to do that with this iguana here today. It's done, boys. There you go. Live caught. Now, he's gorgeous. Um, I will be euthanizing him. I, I try to, anything I live capture and I'm legally able to, I always try to uh, rehome it or, you know, turn it into a pet or use it for education, whatever I can. Euthanization is always the last option, you know, the last resort. Um, unfortunately, these guys, when they reach this size, when they're adults, they won't eat in captivity. They'll starve themselves to death, which is a, a much worse way to go than, you know, how I euthanize them. Uh, essentially, when I euthanize them, um, I cool them down in a refrigerator. I don't freeze them. Um, it, it puts them in, into a sleep, into a coma and then I'm able to take them out um, and painlessly and with no fight, I'm able to euthanize them. And um, I pit the brain and then I remove the head and I honor the lizard by making beautiful products out of it. I don't let anything go to waste. I make use of the meat. Um, I turn the skin into wallets. I even uh, turn the head into taxidermy displays, the legs into keychains, you know, whatever I can to make full use of the animal is the best way um, I find to honor it and, and respect it. So uh, here we go, Florida iguana, invasive species, freshly removed. Yeah. When we came out today, these things, uh, they've taken over. They, uh, you know, they, they, 
they get up by the house, they try to burrow up underneath the house, and it's just a complete nuisance. Well, we got a bunch today, so uh, we'll be cooking them and turning them into wallets. There you go. Yeah, good. I'll bring you some food. Appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. <laughs> so today, in, in you know the short amount of time that we were working on these properties, removing the iguanas, uh, we got over 20 today, and that's just scratching the surface. But um, unfortunately, I got to get down to the Everglades. I got to get focused back on these pythons, and um, we're going to have to save it for another day. So right now we're um, at the beginning of hatching season. Uh, we just went through nesting season. All the females lay their nest for the most part. And now all the nests are just starting to hatch. So uh, it's an exciting time, um, finding a lot of hatchlings and baby pythons to start to. And then also the big females are coming off their nest looking for their first meal. So um, it's when it really starts to pick up. Hey, we got a hatchling in the road right in front of us. Hold on, let me grab my headlamp just in case. This is my first hatchling of the season. Um, man, this thing's fresh too. This is how big they are fresh out the egg. Look how beautiful. You can see it's already the size of a full-grown native snake. Um, they have very few predators. When I find these little hatchlings like this, it's a real easy 50 bucks for me. Um, I get paid 50 bucks for any snake, four foot or under. So they're like little $50 bills uh, slithering around. And uh, especially this one being right in the middle of the levee makes it a lot easier. When they're down on the side of the levee or down in the bushes, good luck finding them. You know, they're, uh, they're very good at hiding. My personal opinion, I don't feel we're ever gonna get rid of these snakes all the way. Um, it'd be great if we could, but I don't see it happening at this point. I have, however, seen over the last year, the native wildlife is coming back. And to me, that's really the name of the game, is protecting our native wildlife, our native mammals. And uh, I feel that's what we're doing. Python, Python, come on. So I'll show you how well they camouflage. Look at this thing. You see it? Come over here. See him up in there? I almost didn't see him. I just saw a little bit of shine through the grass and it just didn't look the same as the rest of the dew. Sure enough, it looks like a good sized python. When you're hunting for these pythons, you're really looking, at least what I look for, is something out of the ordinary. Um, I'm used to what the swamp's supposed to look like and the python just kind of stands out. I'm looking for its pattern, its coloration, and its, its large shape. Honestly, sometimes a snake looks like just even a piece of trash in the weeds. So, like I said, it's something out of the ordinary. Sometimes if you handle them just right, they kind of pick up on your vibe and your energy and they'll kind of calm down on you and not be real aggressive. So we're gonna see what we can do with this guy. See if we can get him to cooperate. Bigger than I thought. It's a 12, 13 foot snake maybe. This is what we were looking for. I'm out here for three to five days at a time and Keeping dead snakes fresh is tough. Um, I turn them all into leather and I also sell the meat and eat the meat myself. I have to turn them into the state and I don't want them handling rotten, messed up snakes. So um, I'll capture them alive and I'll keep them alive up until the last day right before I leave the swamp and then I'll euthanize them all. Capturing them alive by hand outside of that is just the best way to do it. Trying to shoot um, a Burmese python is not a good idea. You're gonna damage the skin. Uh, you're most likely gonna wound the snake and hurt it, which I, I'm all about 
humane euthanization and I don't want to hurt an animal. Um, and it could escape, um, and a lot of them do escape that way. Especially, I'm catching a lot of these snakes in the water. You hit a snake, that thing's gone unless you have your hands on it. So, um, you know, it's definitely the best way to do it, and uh, it's the only way I do it. She's a sweetheart. I can't believe she's letting me do this. They don't do this, I promise you. So the state pays me minimum wage while I'm out here in the swamp and on the levee hunting for them. And then on top of that, they do give me a bounty uh, per foot per snake. It's a little under $25 a foot. And um, you're really not making money unless you're producing snakes every single night, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, but we're out here and we give it our best shot and I've been doing pretty well. Man, that python was real docile. It's a really nice, pretty snake. Um, really goes to show, you know, if, if you handle them right, you can calm them down, but that snake was extra docile. I, I wouldn't be surprised if at one point in time it was maybe even someone's pet and it got a little bit too big and too much for them to handle and they released it. I mean, that thing, it didn't even try to strike at me or open its mouth even after I grabbed it by its neck, so. But um, hey, it, it makes my job easier when they're like that, so I got no problem with it. Most of the snakes I catch are on the sides of the levees or actually even down in the bushes, in the trees, in the water. But sometimes you get lucky and there's a python right in the middle of the levee. I call them Everglades speed bumps. Travis, you got the camera going? Yeah. I think we got some up here. Yeah, yeah, it's one on the road. So we got real lucky. We have an Everglades speed bump here, um, about an eight foot snake. Uh, I'm, I'm catching more snakes about this size, which it's a good sign we're catching smaller snakes. I'm happy to have a real easy capture and a real easy find right in the middle of the levee. And sure enough, we have a, uh, Everglades speed bump here, a nice python. This is about average size of what I catch. Uh, looks to be about maybe seven foot, a little bit larger maybe. I'm gonna go ahead and, oh, this one's pretty cold. It's extremely important for me to show what I'm doing and show the issues we have here in South Florida. A lot of people don't know what we have going on and it's a serious problem. And, and not only the issues and problems we're facing with our environment and our invasive species, but the whole history behind it, the history behind um, people like me uh, that have dated back um, hundreds of years with the Florida Gladesmen, and now it's turned into conservation and, and education and us working to preserve the area we love, the area that gives us our bounty and our livelihood and our recreation and, and to educate everyone about it to get them involved to want to save it as well. So it's a real important thing for me and um, it's something I want to I want to show the world. That's it. Get a bag and go get the next one. If you want to see more what I got going on, you can uh, subscribe uh, to my YouTube in the link below. And uh, if you're interested in products, follow me on Instagram. Please subscribe to The Wizard of Odd TV.